So if I just walk in the door of Florida football, which I did today, you guys opened the whole thing up. If I walk in or maybe, maybe close the door, if I look from the outside and I'm wondering, year three, where is he? Where is that program? How would you answer that being in your seat? Well, I think we, we completely rebuilt the player experience at the University of Florida. Uh, and I would say we're two years in, and uh, this is the first offseason where uh, we feel like we're not solving a major problem or building out a system. Um, and it's been great. I think we've been able to focus our time on the things that really matter. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's by far the best offseason that we've had. Uh, we're about a halfway through. Um, so the best group of players we have and I'm really excited about the changes that we've made the new staff additions um, so so far so good I think if someone who had never coached before took your job they'd probably freak out week to week based on whether things went well or didn't go well but you sure. can't do that and right. you're talking about staff changes you may five to ten percent tweak the way you evaluate but that's got to be a really really broad conversation so how do you decide when it's time to make changes versus let's give it some time, let's be patient? Well, I think ultimately, you know, this is a production business, you know, to some degree we all understand that. So leadership requires you to make tough decisions, you know, and I think you've got to make the decisions in the best interest of the team. Uh, we went through a pretty exhaustive evaluation of where we were at when the season was over. Um, and we made the changes that we felt like would put us in position to continue to improve. You know, I think sometimes uh, we get consumed with the result, but we've got to really uh, think about the efficiency, you know, um, the leadership in certain areas, a new teacher, a new voice, uh, a little bit different philosophy and approach. I, I think we've done that. Um, and one of the reasons that we're here and we've made it to this point is I think we've hired well. Uh, and I think we've got a, a really good building full of people that are capable, that have character, um, and can help us get where we want to go. We were talking a little bit earlier, and I was sort of echoing to you what I've said many times over, let's call it the past eight to ten years, when I've talked about Florida. And that mm -hmm. is great tradition, great brand, like awesome stadium and game day atmosphere. But I don't think the outside world understood maybe how far behind in certain compartments mm -hmm. that it takes to run a major athletics program they had fallen. So you couldn't do anything about that until you got here. When you got here, I remember uh, kind of asking aloud on the show, is he going to get the yeses that he needs? Mm -hmm. And talking to you, it's, it's been a slow but steady process, but this place is immaculate and it looks so much different than it did three or four years ago. Yeah. You're not housed in the stadium anymore. You've got really, really great football only facilities. I think the public just takes for granted that that exists, but it doesn't. How different a world is this now? Well, I think it was part of taking the job. You know, you think about Florida football. I grew up in the 90s. Spurrier was dominating college football. Um, and then my early days at Clemson, you know, 2006, seven, and eight, Urban was here. Uh, and Florida's had some great coaches come through here. So we're, we're doing our homework and our research before taking the job. And I think we felt like there was an opportunity to come in, evaluate the product, evaluate the experience of the player, and go to work. You know, I think there were, the facility plans were in place. Um, Scott Strickland did a phenomenal job of kind of this whole facility uh, overhaul that's been done here and I think we're finally to a point we're in the facility uh, and we're, we're reaping the benefits of that it's helped um, improve our player experience the efficiency of that each day it also is a great first impression in recruiting um, but again it's about the systems and the processes inside the facility uh, the people that are leading each part of the organization. And I think that's where we, get, we continue to refine, we continue to get more efficient. And let's, let's be honest here, college football has changed quite a bit in the last two years. So every six months we've had to adapt and evolve. Uh, but I'm excited about where we're at, and uh, there's no question. This is uh, one of the brands, you know. This is a phenomenal place. We have an incredible experience to offer when you think about playing in the SEC. Uh, and going to school at the number one ranked public school in the country. So we're on the road a whole lot, get to see many programs, and it's, it's a dream job for me, so it's a blessing to be able to do it. So 
touring around here today mm -hmm. and talking to a lot of different people that oversee a lot of different departments. Keeping it generic, you guys do some stuff here that not a lot of people do. And it's not like you've been a head coach for 50 years or anything, mm -hmm. and you've seen it done a million different ways. So which voices do you count on? Which opinions do you count on to, to look at and say, okay, I trust this person. We should do that. That'll keep us on the cutting edge. Because some of this stuff you've got a lot of expertise mm -hmm. in. Some of this stuff you may have no area of expertise in. Well, I think leadership comes down to hiring really good people. I mean, you're only as good, good as the people you surround yourself with. Um, I've been fortunate to work for some of the best, and there's no question. We talk about talent on the field, uh, but it's also important to have talent off the field. You know, um, in particular, I think in college football in today's era, it's a competitive dynamic, and you need dynamic people. Um, so we're fortunate that I think we have the resources and we've made good decisions in the hiring process. You met some of those people today, uh, but there's no doubt uh, we're a little bit different in our, in our approach. I think we're committed to the person, the student, and the player. Um, it's what I believe college athletics should be. Um, and I think you probably experienced that today. How would you describe the energy around the football program right now? Well, you tell me. You were in the building today. I think the energy in the football program is 180 degrees opposite than the perception of it outside. Right. Outside the walls don't matter to you, but I yeah. live out there. Yeah. And so out there, there's a feeling that, and it's this way in a lot of places now. Well, if you don't immediately sure. have success, then he must not be the right guy for the job mm -hmm. or, or that staff must not have things figured out, which is why I'm really glad you guys let us have the look that you let us have. Um, you guys like... You guys closed the season with five losses last year. A lot mm -hmm. of them are close games. So a sure. kick here, a fumble there. You may be talking about you completely different. I guess what I respected the most is, number one, everyone seems to be singing from the same hymnal here. There's <laughs> one message. There's not a bunch of messages. And number two, there's an understanding that the efficiency metric is what you're looking for. Sure. And that could be a three-point win, three-point loss. Like how efficient, right. were, how efficient were you on a given day? Um, I think the outside perspective is way radically different than the inside attitude here. That's what I've experienced. Sure. You know, Graham Mertz got interviewed uh, recently on Paul Feinbaum's show, and they asked him about that. Um, and I think his point, the way he said it was, you know, we're not worried about proving others wrong. We're worried about proving each other right. And I think ultimately the makeup of our team right now is what gives me confidence. Um, and I think we've got a group of people here that have been here from the beginning. We know uh, what's been taking place behind the scenes. And we're close. Okay, we're really close. So um, I think we're all excited about the work that's been done going all the way back to December until now. Um, and we see it. I mean, I've got confidence because I look around that team room and I trust the group of players that are in that room. Uh, and I think we've got really good people around them. So we're getting better. Um, we know we've got work to do, but we're excited about what's to come. The one thing I remember when we went out to the Utah game, you guys opened at Utah last year, and wasn't the greatest day on special teams. Mm -hmm. And it was somewhat of an issue last year, spring game, you had some mishaps. Mm -hmm. So I look from the outside. I have no clue why those things are happening. I just know that that can't happen to play winning football in the fall. Right. So walk me through how you see special teams right here, right now. And, what do you think needs to be done to ratchet that entire operation up? Yeah, so I think there's a little bit of perception and reality there, right? There's no question we had some organizational issues on special teams. Um, and we had a couple young players, true freshmen, that made some critical mistakes. You know, we've got two threes on the field. We have a punt block versus Georgia. We have – we jump over the shield versus Kentucky. Uh, we've got a handful of plays where we got ten on the field. But reality is the, the stats would say that we were pretty good on special teams. I think we were top 25 in the country in EPA, and um, a couple of our units are top 10 in the country. So for me, uh, one of the things that we did in the offseason is we added another layer of expertise there. Uh, Joe Houston came over from the New England Patriots, and he's joined our staff this offseason. Um, so I feel as if uh, we've addressed some of those things. Um, and I really believe if you watch the tape, um, people in our profession would say that 
they respect how we play teams, and we've done that. It's always been part of our DNA as a and culture as a team. So um, there's some perception there that's accurate. There's some organizational issues that we need to address, but reality is we were effective on the field, you know, and I think this, the stats would would uh, confirm that. When I talked to you last year, you had taken Graham Mertz out of the portal, and you said – we looked at all the guys in there. We evaluated them all. We thought mm -hmm. he was the best one. Like He was the one we wanted to take. And I remember listening to that saying, that's interesting. Benefit of the doubt, he knows more than I do. That's interesting, though. Well, then the play on the field sort of bore that out last year. So walk me through kind of how you assess how he played last year. And then there's always an assumption in our world, well, if a guy returns, he's automatically going to get better. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. Is there still a level of his game that you think could scale up? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the – it's the number one thing when you talk about Florida football that's happened here uh, that has set us up to have success in the future is Cram Mertz coming back to play another year of football. Uh, and we get a player who uh, I think has a renewed confidence. You know, I think he starts this offseason as the leader of the team, completely different place than he – was in when he arrived here last year. Um, but we went through an extensive process. We've got a great personnel group um, that collaborates with myself and our staff. Uh, we made the decision we felt was in the best interest of the team, and I think Graham proved us right. You know, and I think um, Graham's MO at um, Wisconsin was inconsistency in, in turning the ball over, and I think he addressed those things. He connected with his teammates. Uh, he earned their respect with how he prepared the example that he set from a work ethic standpoint. And I thought he was a great competitor and he was tough uh, and resilient on game day. So what we've got is we've got a great leader uh, who's extremely sharp. And there's no doubt there's another level just from putting the whole season together. And I think ultimately what I learned last year is we've got to play good around Graham. You know, and I think we've got to protect Graham and we've got to try to uh, play really good play, complimentary play at all the positions on offense. And when we do that, uh, he can be very effective. So there's no doubt he came back. He's got middle round grades. Uh, he came back with a purpose, and he's worked that way so far this offseason. When last season wrapped up, there was a lot of talk around the program of, will Coach Napier still call plays this upcoming year? Mm -hmm. And so I know what the message boards say. Walk <laughs> me through how you actually decide year to year if you're going to change anything operationally and then that specifically what thought goes into that i think it goes back to kind of what we talked about um in the beginning there's no doubt the first two years here uh, it's almost like you're trading a couple years of your life there's so much work to do to get things up and running um you know we've always had confidence in our system we've always been very efficient um and I think the working relationship with Graham, in particular with the player-to-coach communication piece or the coach-to-player communication piece this offseason that's being added, we've got a really good system. It's been it's proven. I think we finished the season uh, playing really efficient on offense and putting our team in position to win. You know, So um, we have reallocated some of our responsibilities. I think uh, giving Russ Callaway the co-coordinator title giving him a little bit more ownership throughout the offseason um, and some of the things that we do in-house. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I feel like it's in the best interest of our team for me to continue to call the plays, right? So uh, if I didn't feel that way, I would have made a decision uh, to make a change. So I'm excited about the input uh, that we're getting from the staff and some of the things we've done to reorganize. But overall, um, you know, more focus on the things that matter. You know, like I mentioned before, um, I don't think the place is under construction. I think it's built, uh, and I think this is going to allow me an opportunity to focus a little bit more on the things that matter, and play calling is a part of that. Administratively here, how firm a grasp and understanding do you feel like the people you answer to have of where you've been, where you are, where you think you're going, and what that actually takes? Well, I, first of all, I think we've got phenomenal leadership. You know, I've been impressed with the University of Florida as a whole when it comes to that. Um, and I think my confidence comes that they've been living it with us, right? And I think uh, 
Scott Strickland's been phenomenal relative to um, the vision that he had when we arrived that we talked about before we came here and the things he's done to help us. Uh, and then Dr. Sass has been uh, incredible in terms of listening and then helping solve problems. You know, I think that's the thing that I can appreciate is he's a big picture thinker and he listens and he helps you solve problems. So we've got great support. Uh, we've got great investors in the program. There's a, uh, in the NIL space, we're thankful for uh, the, the system we've built. Uh, Florida Victorious has been phenomenal in that regard. Uh, and again, like I talked before, it's been two years of really, really hard work, but I think this is the first off season where I kind of look around and say, hey, most of our processes uh, are in a good place, and that now it's about becoming more efficient, and uh, I think that's going to lead to better football. You mentioned the whole NIL piece, and those are just three letters people say. Most people aren't living in that world. I don't live in that world. Um, I get a peek at it sometimes, but you were describing your situation here, and it sort of echoes what I've heard from a lot of the places around the country, and that's when NIL kind of got thrown in our lap. We did the best we could. We were drinking water from a fire hose, and we had four or five collectives, it seemed like, and so it's a process to get all that streamlined. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how tough was that here? Well, I think, I mean, I think the time, effort, and energy that we put into NIL that's been part of the job, right, is solving that problem and coming up with the best system uh, to help you be competitive, you know, not only to attract good talent and be competitive in the recruiting space, but also to retain your talented players. And there was a ton of uncertainty. I think the market changed every six months. Uh, the rules changed every six months, right, not only with NCAA, but state laws, um, and, you know, what's real and what's not real. And I think every coach struggled a little bit with that. So the big thing is I think we built a system here that allows us to operate within our rules, right? We've set parameters for ourselves, uh, and we've got great leadership. Uh, Jose Costa and Nate Barbera have done a great job with Florida Victorious. And they not only run NIL for football, but they do that for all 21 sports here. Uh, and there's alignment, and I think that's benefiting and will continue to benefit the University of Florida. Uh, I, for some reason, started to get fascinated about this whole work-life balance concept. <laughs> and I, I've always believed if you're going to achieve it at a really, really high level in any particular sector, some balance is at least going to have to be sacrificed. So I say that phrase, work-life balance. How much of it do you think you have? How important do you think it is? I think it's huge. And I think ultimately for you to sustain something, to repeat something, to get better at something, uh, you've got to build a calendar and a year-round plan that allows you to do that. You know, and I think for me, balance starts with family, you know, and I think that's the challenging part of taking over a program, uh, especially in the last two years. I would tell you that's been very challenging. But again, that's the exciting part to me is I actually feel like um, this off season, I feel a little bit more like it used to feel, you know, before the portal before NIL. I think we've got good in-house processes to answer those things. Everybody understands what's expected. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. Um, and again, the game always is evolving, but I think in the last two years it's been really interesting. So um, balance is important, you know, and I think at some point um, you got to know who you are. You got to know what you want your program to be about. You know, what are your values? What are your convictions? Um, and ultimately, for me, that comes down to people, family being at the top of that list, and certainly for our staff and for our players. I think it's important that we model that. So it's one good thing about here. I do think that we have um, worked extremely hard to build what we have, um, and I'm excited about what hopefully that will lead to in the future. Uh, my biggest fear, period, is lightning. Terrified of it. Um, you, can, you can go through your general life or you can just talk football specific. Is there a thing that you constantly worry about? Maybe it's within your control, maybe it's not, but it just keeps you up at night and that's always the thing you're kind of on guard about. Yeah, you know, I, I think for me it's, um, it's doing what is in the best interest of the people you've been entrusted with. You know, I think you make 
part of this job is you make decisions that affect a lot of people, right? So uh, putting time and effort and discernment into all these decisions relative to how they not only affect yourself, but more importantly, how they affect uh, all the people that you've been entrusted with, right? Where there's some stewardship um, that comes with the job, you know, relative to, um, yeah, it just impacts a lot of people, right? And you want to do your best for your people, uh, your staff, your players, their families, uh, and you try to make decisions in the best interest of the team. And we all understand that football uh, is a game that's made up of people, right? And I think that's probably you just want to make good decisions for your people, and that's ultimately what I think a lot about. Sometimes we'll be in post-game press conference settings, and a coach will say, we had a great week of practice. Other times you'll hear him say, I didn't love our week of practice. When you get towards the end of one of those weeks, mm -hmm. and there's a Saturday coming up, and you don't feel like you've had the best week of practice, how different is your mentality? Does it change anything you do on Friday or Saturday before a game? Is there any kind of maybe jump-starting that you're trying to do mentally to guys to make up for what maybe you thought lacked during the week? Yeah, I think it's a daily deal. You know, I think you're evaluating each day and where you're at, and then you're coming up with a, a solution. Okay, hey, what do we need to do? Hey, it's Sunday, where are we at? Part of uh, leadership is having a pulse for your team. You know, and I think that's where uh, relationships with players and people within your organization and their relationship with the players, and you do that as a group. And I think it's a it's a daily exercise throughout the week, and you're trying to get your team in position. No team's that perfect when you get to game day. I mean, there's no – in a game like football, it's almost like you're only as good as your worst day, right? And the consistency, how, how close can you get to performing at the top of your ability each week? And I think the teams that can do that are the ones that uh, win more often. So consistency is key. And I think this is a game about preparation. And throughout the season, there's no doubt what you're describing is part of it. So we just wrapped spring here. And you, congratulations. A lot of people mm -hmm. are going to tell you you got the toughest schedule in the country this fall. And I'm sure you worry about that on a day-to-day -day basis. But I am very interested, uh, two-parter here, what is the centralized core focus of this thing will determine how good we are this fall. Ultimately, based on what you saw this spring, how good do you feel like you guys can be this fall? Yeah, I mean, I think the schedule thing is a hot topic. Um, but, you know, I don't know that it's going to change at the University of Florida. I mean, given our current dynamic, uh, the league that we play in, uh, the non-conference schedule that we play, it's always going to be challenging, right? And I think... Um, we're not playing the teams that finished the, t the season ranked, and we don't have the team that we finished the season with, right? So it's ultimately going to be decided on the field in the fall, uh, and all we can do is get consumed with our team, each individual part of our team, every player, every uh, person within the organization, and how we execute our process to be the most prepared when we get to the season. Uh, I talked to the team yesterday uh, we're kind of halfway through the off season, and I really believe where our team is at right now. It's going to come down to the intangibles. Uh, I think we've got enough pieces. Um, it's going to come down to our values, right? Like what type of integrity, togetherness, discipline, effort, toughness, belief. You know, what can we create this summer? I think college football, football in general, your team is constructed in the summer. Uh, when the staff is away uh, for a big portion of that time. So the good thing about the University of Florida football right now is we have credible leadership at the player level. We've got some guys that are living it out every day, uh, and when they speak, our players listen. So that gives me confidence. And, uh, look, part of the recruiting pitch to every one of these guys on our team is, like, we have work to do at the University of Florida, and you're either up for the challenge or you're not, Okay. These guys came here, uh, they accepted that challenge, and it's waiting on us in the fall. What's very interesting is I'm talking to you the Tuesday the portal opens is how different it may be if you're a brand-new head coach with a roster full of guys that you inherited mm -hmm. versus maybe your three, a chunk, a core, a nucleus of your guys or guys that you recruited. Because right. those are the guys that, for better or for worse, you recruited, you recruited with messaging. 
And so, you know, talking to some people in the building, one of the one of the themes that you pick up on is, yeah, what they sell you on is what you get here. Right. There's there's not really a whole lot of misleading. So for better or for worse, what we have is what we were right. we were sold. I've got to imagine you'll never have your concerns alleviated. Anything can happen. It's the new era of sure. college football. But it's got to be a little bit more um, a relieved feeling when you mm -hmm. go to bed at night knowing. I actually know those guys. I recruited them. I know their mom, I, their dad. I know their family. Right. I can have frank conversations with them because they've they've known me through the whole process. Yeah, that's the most challenging part about the last couple of years is it's hard enough to build trust um, in a normal world, much less the world we've been living in in college athletics the last two years. So, you know, we've got relationships with the majority of our team. We recruited the majority of our team. And then we, the ones we didn't recruit, I think we've proven over time that we are who we say we are. And I think in, in college athletics right now, it's about the voice of reason around each kid, right? The stability at home, who are their mentors, who are the parents, um, what type of program did they come from? Um, and at a place like this, you should be able to attract the best. We get to decide who we sign and they sign up for what we're selling. And I really believe you tend to attract what you're selling. Uh, and that gives me some confidence uh, about the makeup of our team. Last thing here. Uh, I know players will go into their off-season mode and you've got an entire calendar for them. But for you and your coaching staff, I assume you'll have player interviews mm -hmm. and exits that start as soon as today. What else is on the agenda from now until the next time we see you at media days or when fall sure. camp opens? Yeah, so we'll begin um, individual meetings with all the players. They're going to meet with the position coach, the coordinator, and myself. Uh, we really recap the first half of the offseason, and then we present an individualized development plan for them when they get back. Um, you know, our staff will go on the road next week, um, and obviously you're working on 25s, 26s, 27s. Uh, then we'll come back. We'll begin the official visit process. Our players will start summer school uh, March, uh, May 13th, uh, and we'll have you know a huge 10 to 11 week uh, block of training. Uh, we do OTAs in June and July, and then obviously training camp is right around the corner. So, still quite a bit of work to be done to kind of create the identity for this group, but. You know, half of the work has been done, and um, I'm proud of our team. You know, I believe in our team, um, and I'm excited about the rest of the way. That, by the way, that, for a fan, it's like molasses in December. It takes forever to get to August. Do you feel like this time of year goes by really fast, or do you feel like it crawls by? I mean, I think, man, we've got a lot of problems to solve each day. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we're, you know, ultimately – that's the thing I'm excited about is I think I know what the workload looks like between now and when we play. Um, it's been quite different the last couple of years. But if your roster is stable, then that creates less chaos in the next six weeks, right? And you're able to allocate your time on things that really matter. So I feel like we're finally playing with a lead from a roster management standpoint. Uh, and that's going to allow us to focus on relationships with players, right? Um, how to teach better, how to um, do things a little bit more efficient in June, right, when they get back. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're finally in a good place when it comes to that. It's been a first-class visit. Billy Napier, we appreciate it, man. Thank you, man.